All right, colleagues, we will move on to our next briefing on issues related to homelessness. We'll, David Gray will be leading this briefing and update. And this is focused on a, the Marshalling Yard emergency shelter update. Welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair and Council Members. Um, David Gray, I'm the Homeless Strategy Officer for the City of Austin. Also joining me today is Gary Pollock. He leads our Policy and Planning Unit. Um, and on days that I'm out, Gary typically serves as acting HSO, so I asked him to be here with me today uh, to help me through this presentation. Thanks, Gary, for being here. Thanks. Honored to be here. Yeah. So today we want to give a quick update on the Marshalling Yard. As many of you know, Marshalling Yard is a temporary shelter that was established in August of last year. Um, as of uh, May 1st, we served 755 clients at the Marshalling Yard. And uh, just as a reminder, our clients who are here get access to a suite of services, uh, including three meals a day, daily transportation to and from uh, appointments or uh, frequent locations throughout the city. We have an on-site animal shelter, on-site showering facilities, uh, et cetera. Um, you can see on this slide that our weekly census remains pretty high. Uh, on any given night, the shelter is full or nearly full. Uh, any beds that are, are vacant are typically beds that we're either holding for people that our street outreach team is going to bring in the next day, uh, maybe a respite bed that we're holding for clients who need that service or an ADA bed. Uh, but by and large, the shelter remains full on any given night. Uh, this is just a recap of our outcomes. Um, we are working to get updated data since we last met. But when we last met a couple of weeks ago and talked about Marshalling Yard, uh, we had about a 20% positive exit rate. Uh, I believe this has gone up a little bit, um, but next time we meet to talk about Marston Yard, we'll make sure that we have the updated data and information available for you. The big update that we wanted to present to you today focuses on our plans for winding down the operations at the Marston Yard. Uh, so council members and Madam Chair, as you might recall, council authorized an extension of the Marston Yard through the end of March, 2025. Uh, council also directed us to return and provide a roadmap uh, for how we are planning to wind down the shelter, including ways to ensure that we're providing our shelter clients with housing resources. Uh, we, so the plan that you're going to see and that we're going to talk through in a moment, we'll talk about when we will cease intakes, uh, how we are trying to set up our clients for success. The ultimate goal here is to ensure nobody gets returned to the streets. Uh, when possible, we're going to move people into permanent housing or a housing opportunity. We might move people into shelter, uh, but we are not going to return anybody to the streets uh, unless that client decides to reject every opportunity that we give them. And then they, they self-select to return to unsheltered um, homelessness. So in terms of the timeline, and I'll, I'll just touch on this quickly. So currently, we're still in normal intake operations. Uh, we have not shifted our intake procedures. However, we are modifying how we do our case management delivery. Uh, part of the council direction was for us to work with endeavors and a local provider to increase local case management at the shelter. Uh, and so we've been in conversations with the Sunrise Navigation Center and the Endeavor staff to increase the number of Sunrise case managers. Uh, we've even contemplated having Sunrise do all the case management at the Marshalling Yard and just having Endeavors focus on actually maintaining the, the physical building. Uh, and so those conversations are progressing, um, looking forward to having some real tangible results from those conversations in the days ahead. Beginning in September is when we're going to shift our operating posture at the Marshalling Yard. Uh, once we get to September 1st, we will limit new intakes. Uh, the referrals will focus on clients who have a uh, verified housing resource. Housing resource in most cases means that the client has a housing voucher. Uh, there's a unit that's more or less been identified for that client, and we're just waiting for that unit to become available. Uh, oftentimes, our outreach teams will come across clients who are unsheltered, who are able to return to family here in Austin or in other parts of the country. Uh, they just need help getting back to their family. Uh, so in those cases, when we verify that people have a stable living place to return to, uh, we want to bring them into the shelter as well, provide them with the diversion support or rapid exit support that they need, and then move those folks into housing. Uh, so what we are not going to do after September is provide general access to the shelter to anybody. 
Uh, we're doing this to make sure that we give ourselves the benefit of getting through the summer months uh, without shifting our operations and shutting down referrals, but also making sure that we have enough time on the back end to get people placed and, and get people housed. Beginning December 1st uh, is when we plan to stop all intakes into the Marceline Yard. It really focus on the clients who are in shelter at that time. Uh, I should have mentioned that in September, we are considering uh, beginning to ramp down overall capacity at the Marceline Yard. We haven't made that determination just yet. We kind of want to see what our clientele looks like once we get to that point. Uh, but in December, we could ha still have 300 beds online. We could also have 200 beds online. Uh, time, we, we just need the benefit of some more time to, to see what the needs of our clients are once we get there. But anyway, once we get to December, uh, that's when we see salt intakes, and then we're working exclusively on identifying housing or alternative shelter operations for our program participants. Those alternative shelter operations could mean that we're placing clients in bridge shelters uh, or the Arch or H Street, which are city-owned uh, facilities. It could also mean that we're working with our partners at TOOF or at Salvation Army or somewhere else to see if they have availabilities and if our clients would be a good suit for those communities. Um, and so we're gonna give ourselves the benefit of about three, four months to do that work. And then at the end of March is when we will officially close the Marsh Clean Yard per council direction and then return the facility back to the convention center. Uh, again, I just really wanna underscore the point here that our ultimate goal is that no one is returned to unsheltered uh, and unhoused homelessness. Uh, that, that is not why we are here. Our, our goal is to pull people out of an unsheltered environment. Once you're in our care, our sole purpose is to make sure that you get housed. Uh, so there will not be a mass exodus of people back into encampments on the streets or in our parks or in creeks or in waterways. And so we, would, we do welcome feedback from this committee on today's presentation. Uh, and then, you know, to the extent that, that we're able to, we will incorporate that feedback into our ramp down plans. Uh, this is the, you know, we, Gary can attest that we spent many hours and, and many, many meetings thinking through the best way to do this in service of our clients. Uh, we think that this timeline optimizes uh, our utilization of the marshaling yard for the period that we have. But of course, uh, we welcome feedback. And with that, Madam Chair, yes. I'm happy to yield back to you for any questions. Yes, I'll, I'll kick us off with a couple of questions and then we'll yield to my colleagues. Um, and thank you for mentioning that the marshaling yard is slated to close in March. Um, what, how much headway have we made in identifying an alternative site? It's been very challenging finding an alternative location. We've been working with the city's real estate department, looking at every uh, piece of city owned property. Uh, unfortunately, we have not been able to find a, a viable location that we think works really well. Uh, any city facility that we believe could be converted into shelter currently has another use. Uh, vacant land that is available is either in a flood area or it's on the periphery of the city and not really close to city services. We are continuing our quest to look for alternative locations. We're now kind of shifting our focus and looking into the private real estate market, but to date we have not been able to find uh, a, a, a solid alternative for the marshaling yard. So how confident are, is HSO that we will find a replacement for the marshaling yard by the end of March? We're, we're committed to doing our best to try to find a replacement. We're, we're committed to leaving no stone unturned. Uh, at this point though, we have been unsuccessful in that pursuit. Okay, colleagues. Thank you, Reginald pick up a little bit where the chair left off and I'm curious as we think about a replacement or you know just finding additional shelter capacity there aren't many 70,000 square foot facilities uh, set up like the marshaling yard but one could argue maybe the marshaling yard is not the ideal setup to begin with right so we have the opportunity here to to figure out what is right. I'm curious as we think about um, office space, which typically wouldn't be thought of as any kind of um, you know, residential space, but you know, the marshaling yard itself is just one big open space, right? And an uninhabited office maybe is that same just stacked, right? Instead of one huge plate, you have multiple plates, but that could actually help serve to, to separate populations. So I'm curious as we look at 
now in the private market, is that one option of, of just basically complete open office space that operates kind of like segments of the marshalling yard? It, it could be, right? Um, it, of course, the, it always comes down to the details of the actual space. But as part of our private market analysis, yes, we have looked at vacant office space, vacant medical offices, vacant warehouses, vacant gyms. I mean, we're, we're thinking about all the different types of spaces that could potentially be retrofitted into emergency shelter. Okay. Well, I, you know, in, in the search for feedback here, the one thing I would really like us to try to do is if we are going to make a, an investment, make it in something that we acquire rather than lease because, you know, if we lease, we end up spending a lot of money and at the end of the day not having an asset we can reuse. And so that would be the, the number one thing I would hope that we achieve out of this in our new space, whatever that new space is. Um, you and I have talked a little bit about whether it is, you know, congregate spring shelter or non-congregate, kind of like what they're doing at Esperanza Community with these micro shelters you know, how long would it take to stand up a site like this if we did have land available? It, again, it depends on the style of shelter. Um, some of the spring shelters have gone up very quickly. Those tend to be congregate or uh, semi-congregate shelters. Uh, but also what we've seen is even in the non-congregate shelter setting, if, if the land is right and things are in the right conditions, those can come up in seven to 10 months. Uh, you might recall just last week, council gave us the green light to uh, add a million dollars to the other one's foundation's contract to bring on 100 more shelter beds at Camp Esperanza. Uh, and in that conversation, you know, we feel like we can get those 100 beds online within the next eight months. And so part of it depends on the zoning for the land and, and just kind of what that looks like. There's obviously some community engagement that we'd have to do. But then to actually pop up the shelter is going to depend on if there's utilities on site or are we bringing in showers and restrooms uh, like we did to augment some of the operations over at the marshalling yard. Uh, but those are all things that we're looking at, you know, as we try to identify a, a good location that can either lend itself for us to pop something up or retrofit something. And Gary, did you want to add anything to, to that? Um I mean, we've been looking at other cities as well to see what what they've been doing in these scenarios, whether it's like parking lots and figuring out how to utilize church parking lots, public parking lots, et cetera. Um, and, and there are some options, but I think there's a cost to weigh both with temporary infrastructure versus, like, as you said, permanent infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I think nothing's off the table. So we're, we're still kind of looking and, and thinking and, and kind of trying to learn about what else other folks are doing so that we can use those best practices. Yeah. And, and, you know, we had public testimony here about you know, Denver's Safe Outdoor Spaces program, which is, you know, essentially a, a form of sanctioned camping. I'm curious, has that entered the conversation in this analysis and if you could help kind of highlight, you know, when I first came here, it, it, I thought intuitively seemed like that's so cheap. You buy a piece of land, you say, go camp here, and what's the cost? Uh, I've come to learn differently. And so I was hoping you might just talk a little bit li about that style of providing space for individuals, uh, what costs we have and not, and, and whether or not that's even in consideration. Sure. Gary, you want to take that one also? Sure. Um, I mean, we've not looked thoroughly at it to, to review costs. I know that um, the model in Denver um, and then in, in Seattle as well, there have been more safe spaces that have popped up, um, and they're kind of short-term. They move from different different parking lots around the city over time. Um, I think that the capital to, to build the structures is similar to probably what we're seeing at Esperanza. Um, but... Um, there is definitely flexibility in bringing providers on site and making sure that there's kind of 24-7 security with portables and, and, and other assets. So I think um, that's something that we've not gone down the road for it just yet, but really just looking at, like, what are other folks doing, you know, and looking at things like safe parking, right? Uh, parking lots, in, in, especially in California, there's a lot of programs around safe parking. If folks have operable cars, they can spend the night, have access to showers. Um, that's fairly cheap. 
Um, but again, they have to have operable cars and, and, and whatnot. But. And then I'll just quickly piggyback off of that to say that here in Texas, if we did want to designate an area as a safe and camping area, uh, that's obviously a decision that we would come to you as council to vote and give us some approval on. And we would also have to go to the state of Texas to get approval as well. And so, so far, our focus has been on looking at what's completely in our realm of control. Uh, that's an option that's not fully within our realm of control. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Just so I'm clear, getting state approval, if we did want to have a sanctioned campsite, we have to get state approval. They meet only every other year, so we would have to have that approval during the next legislative session. I don't know if, if it's the legislature that grants the approval. I'd have to look into it. It might be it a, 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 agency. Yeah, it's okay. a state agency, yeah. right? Okay. But but essentially, what we would have to do is identify the location in the city that we would want to use. Uh, we would obviously do extensive stakeholder engagement around that to let the community know about our intentions. Come to council and get your approval, and then whatever the process is that the state has designated, uh, we would have to then shift and follow that procedure before we're able to designate. Uh, a location as safe and camping. I will say we are anticipating the Supreme Court's decision soon on uh, encampments. It, it could have come out today, it could come out any time uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and as we as we think about that and kind of the implications of whatever that uh, could have for Austin, uh, that's really kind of recharged us in looking at the safe and camping option, knowing that we don't have enough shelter beds currently available for everybody who's seeking shelter. Thank you. A couple more questions on my end. Um, how soon will we have the data on the success of the Sunrise case management? Um, once we get Sunrise more under contract uh, through our contract with Endeavors, uh, they utilize the same HMIS uh, system as everybody else in our system uses. And so uh, as soon as they're able to start entering that data, uh, I then go to Gary and, and his team to pull it. Uh, so it, it's not that long of a delay, uh, but I do want to be clear that we're still having that conversation with Sunrise and Endeavors to figure out the best case management resource mix. So we're we're not there just yet. Okay. And what are the expected outcomes for clients of the marshaling yard when it closes if there is not a replacement that is found? Uh, again, every client will be offered an opportunity for either housing or shelter. Uh, and so if clients have a housing voucher or a housing destination that we can safely place them into, uh, then we will help them transition into that housing. Sometimes that can be a, a PSH unit. Uh, I know that we have clients, for example, who are on track to, to lease a unit at Pecan Gardens when that opens. Uh, we have clients who return with loved ones and we verify that those loved ones exist and that they're willing to take the client in before we divert there. Any client that we cannot place in the housing will be offered an opportunity in another city shelter. Now, that could have effects on some of our other programs like the HEAL initiative, uh, but we are not going to know that until we get a little bit further into the year and we can kind of take a, a kind of recheck around which of our clients have housing resources and which ones are more likely going to have to transition to another shelter. Yeah, because you mentioned in September is when you'll start changing the intake procedures, only accept those who have some sort of uh, verified housing resource. Um, this will have an impact on the HEAL initiative and the encampment cleanups to some extent, but we won't know to what extent that impact will be for a while. Exactly. Yeah, we're not really going to know until once we get out of summer what that capacity will look like. And I would like to clarify, you know, as part of our normal marshaling yard operations, we are helping people get housed. So we're, we're doing the work. We're just going to focus more exclusively on that work and on that clientele once we get to September. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you.